Hello and welcome to the Book of Leaves podcast. My name is Cara Kearney and I'm the host of the show. Hi and welcome to Book of Leaves, a podcast where I interview people who are doing their bit for the planet and we take a leaf from their book. Before we delve into this episode, uh, can I just say that this is now an award winning podcast excuse me so at the Irish Podcast Awards that I was talking about in the last episode I went along anyway not expecting anything because I'm up against two brilliantly produced RTE podcasts like Ecolution and Hot Mess and I won won best climate best podcast for the climate award which is just amazing um, couldn't believe it and I'm so appreciative to everyone who has shown uh, has given well wishes and shown their support since then um, it's just lovely because I'm a one woman show and I was literally thinking about giving up this a few weeks ago when I, I missed a couple of episodes and I couldn't juggle it with all the jobs that I do so and I was like I don't even have that many listeners compared to so many other podcasts but that doesn't matter like it actually does not matter to me you, you know when you're only just feeling low when you start like looking out for things to to I don't know upset you or whatever so yeah I've got a small community here but obviously I'm doing something right because there was loads of judges and they thought Book of Leaves deserved the gold place for Climate Award. So just over the moon and thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And for anyone who is new to the podcast from uh, since then, since the Irish Podcast Awards, you're very welcome. It is lovely to have you here. And I have the podcast award just sitting uh, over my shoulder for when I interview people to see. But anyway, I digress. Just very appreciative and I know there was lots of podcasts who weren't at the podcast awards because they didn't submit themselves and hopefully next year it'll be a bit more accessible that we will have more podcasts in the mix. Now this episode we are going to be chatting to a gardener by the name of Connor who I met and um, we've co- connected online a couple of months ago you know I, I follow people who are doing good things for the planet and he invited me to this foraging event that Still Garden Distillery were doing, Still Garden make uh, spirits they're very new you'll hear all about them and the work that they do and how they work but they are so tuned in to the environment and to science and community so I talked to Connor about his journey and some gardening tips and foraging tips and how distilleries and people can reduce food waste so it's really interesting I hope you guys like it as well um if you're more, if you want to know more about foraging and we're at the perfect time for it, go check out episode 38. I interview a forager called Dermot from Northern Ireland um, and we go into loads of detail about, you know, wild garlic and three cornered leeks and what to look out for and what not to look out for, um, how not to poison yourself and how uh, it's really beneficial for our mental health as well, foraging. Um, so yeah, here is Connor's interview. I have linked everything that he mentioned in the show notes I've also linked their show their socials as well as still garden socials and uh, if you enjoy this podcast please do recommend it to a friend share it on your socials um, if you're on Spotify you can click five stars if you're on Apple Podcasts, you can rate it and leave a review that would be amazing and I do have a patreon and a buymeacoffee.com uh, forward slash book of leaves where you can subscribe where you can donate once off to the running of the podcast and yeah here's Connor's chat I'll catch you guys after Connor, thank you so much for joining me for the Book of Leaves podcast. It is so lovely to have you here and I can't wait to delve into your brain because I know you have a lot of knowledge from the foraging trip we went on. So I'm very excited for this chat and thank you. Can you introduce yourself to listeners so they know who you are? Yeah, so I'm I'm Connor Howlett. Uh, thank you for having me, Cara. <laughs> and I'm the gardener for Still Garden Distillery, which is kind of a niche, obscure role that uh, a lot of distilleries don't really have. I remembered I was in London once and the distiller at the time um, had basically online introduced me to one of the bartenders at, at the bar I was going to. and um, But he just told him that I was the gardener. So I went in uh, and then he said, oh, you must be the gardener. I had long blonde hair then at that point. So he he recognize me from, from sight alone uh but then when i sat down he said but what like so what do you actually do at the distillery and i was like what do you mean I, i'm the gardener and he said yeah but is that not a, a nickname <laughs> i was like no 
<laughs> so it's the gardener like exactly wwe something <laughs> yeah yeah so uh i mean maybe he thought i was just uh really good with garnishes or um <laughs> that uh, i was maybe growing something else for for the bartenders but um yeah so i mean it's it's a very niche position but it's one that i feel that i've kind of really found myself falling into uh, and i'm delighted that to, to be able to be a gardener for a distillery uh, that involves a few different things that uh, I'm sure we'll get into a bit later, but that's my main role, my main uh, line of work. But then I'm also I also look after the plants for Rascals Brewery, which is right next door to the distillery. Oh wow, as that's well. handy. Uh, so that goes quite well. Um, I do a few freelance gardening jobs as well in Inchcore and then beyond, uh, and then. So you very uh, much have a green thumb. Yeah, I can't exactly. keep anything alive except aloe vera. And that's by fluke. It arrives to me alive. Yeah. I barely water it and it's okay. Whereas I buy herbs or I'll buy, um, someone gave me a gift of succulents before for mm -hmm. a swap that we did. Um, she gave me instructions on how to keep them alive. I killed them. I tried growing vegetables. They died. <laughs> My carrots are <laughs> tiny. So I really admire what you do. And I think it's it's just, I think it's good to know for listeners as well. Not every environmentalist has a green thumb. Um, mm. But it's, uh, it's fascinating, the knowledge that you have. But how did you end up getting into that? Did you do this in college? Or like, were your family really into the gardening? Or where did that kind of inspiration come from? So, I mean, I grew up in the countryside, surrounded by nature and, and like a, we had a lovely garden growing up as well. My parents were quite into gardening. My grandparents were really into gardening. I never really got that into it as a kid. Uh, like I, I thought it was nice. I enjoyed gardens. I, I like spending mm. time outside. But in terms of actually like getting stuck in and growing things, that wasn't really something I did at all. But uh, I would spend a lot of time outside. Like I'd spend most of my childhood, my adolescence out in the woods and kind of the rural areas where, I, where I'm from. By the time I came mm. to Dublin, I, I really noticed the lack of green space around me and I felt that I needed to find it, bring it into my own living living area as well. So that's kind of when I started to get into gardening. It's funny what you say about me having a green thumb is that I just seem to be able to grow things by fluke. Like I remember, <laughs> like I, there's just even like with things like avocados. So if you look up how to grow an avocado tree, you see this really complicated kind of technique where you put I don't know uh, cocktail sticks in in the actual yeah I've seen pit. pictures of this and like you soak it in water for ages and like dangle it off a cup and speak yeah. in kind words to it and it might sprout a thing exactly um, yeah. but then f for me like I, I sliced open an avocado that I was going to eat and then I saw that it had like a little sprout in it uh, like a, a little kind of shoot trying to form so I thought oh why not I'll just I'll stick it in the soil uh so I got I got a pot just put it in soil and then it became a tree and it just <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that I just seem to have a bit of a fluke with uh, with doing stuff like that. And even like we have a, a compost bin that I put on our balcony uh, where I live now. And uh, as I was getting compost out of it, I found another avocado pit that had sprouted, and now it's got another little sapling that I have in in the apartment now. Oh so, my god, um, that's amazing! Yeah, um, but then in, like in terms of actually studying it, I. I was a film student and uh, I studied English as well along with that. So uh, it's not something that I did in kind of traditional route. Um, mm. But then college is great for things like societies. So yeah. I got involved with the Botanical Society. I found, again, the fact that I was studying what I loved, but also for what a lot of people is a hobby. I found that quite suffocating. Uh, and especially being surrounded by art students, I'm sure you know yourself, um, mm. With we're all having existential crises all the time. Uh, I don't know what so, you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never had one of them. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so it's quite it's kind of refreshing to spend a bit of time. I found with with science students who have different kind of interests and hobbies, but then also academic interests as well. So I, I started to get involved with the botanical society, and then found myself getting really into into gardening and foraging, uh, foraging from there. So Amazing. that's kind of how it started for me. That's brilliant. Yeah, like you said, societies in colleges are so, so useful for fostering like what you what you might be interested in, but you've never actually kind of copped like or yeah. and just are brilliant for just meeting people and making friends, you know, if the people in your course um, you know, you're not clicking with or yeah, there's just there's so many things that you can learn and they do 
brilliant things for universities bringing speakers in and everything like that like I have a really fond memory of sports and socks in college so absolutely never joined the botanical one maybe that's why I'm killing all my plants (laughs) but that's that's really cool so then you came to Dublin then when you say you're the gardener some people might be picturing well maybe not listeners to this because we kind of know what kind of garden we're into but typically Mm. the gardener does the weeding and does the mowing the grass and does the the trimming of the rose bush and everything is really well manicured that's not the type of gardener you are so what type of gardening is it that you do yeah so I mean I my gardening is more specifically it's wildlife and pollinator friendly uh, but it's also botanical gardening in the sense of growing botanicals for us to use in the distillery as well Uh, but at the same time trying to have this balance of keeping the garden as a community space that people are very welcome to come come and use, but also the the practicalities of that and that, you know, you can't have everything super manicured because people walk through it. Uh, some people bring their dogs, which is not always ideal. Um, so because of that, you kind of had to have a, a balance between growing things for the optimal kind of seed fruit production. But at the same time, you have sacrificial spaces as well in there. Um and things that sections that you specifically want to rejuvenate and to encourage uh, wildlife and, and pollinators, which helps in which in turn helps the more pruned and manicured sections as well, which where would be where we'd grow the botanicals further down the garden. So it's a bit of a mad mix uh, of like at the top of the garden. Uh, it's kind of like a, for those who haven't been there, it's a bit of a narrow strip. What well, was landscaped on top of former wasteland that used to be a dumping site, uh, which was oh. also filled with rich biodiversity like even behind the garden there's still a lot of interesting things growing there like there's elder trees uh, there's lots of blackberries growing down there there's a lot of wild salvias uh, which is a great habitat for wild bees all that kind of slope uh, it's on the slope of the Kamak river but because people see a giant overgrown space with no sign of, of management they think oh great a bin i can dump my fridge here i can dump my burnt out urinal Gosh. here i don't even know how that happens but it, it was there but something we've we've really noticed is since the garden's been established, the dumping it still takes place, but it will take place on on the borders of the garden. It's uh, the litter is not really an issue, with the exception of uh, of blow-ins from from the road, really. So, right. Um, which is which is great to see. It's frustrating, you know, that it's still those sections, which again are really important for for wild bees and solitary bees, are being dumped on, but. It's definitely an improvement from what it used to be. Yeah. Um, And I think that's just the case of like where education is really needed and people kind of being reconnected with nature and given that sense of ownership. Like a lot of people dump like they just they've probably they've probably never had that kind of relationship with mm-hmm. nature you know and they probably have other stuff going on in their life um or whatever but then and then it might just be laziness which is you know either way it's not okay but but uh we hopefully we do have to make steps to try kind of like bridge that gap i think between mm-hmm. people but then what is it about the still garden distillery that you know there's so many different no, not brewers, but spirit makers out there. But Still Garden have a very kind of different, unique approach to what they do, and they seem quite like small as well. Can you kind of can you introduce, I guess, the company and the kind of work that they try to do for community and the environment? Yeah, so I mean, the the company was kind of it was a COVID baby, effectively, and that the big grand opening of it was March twenty twenty. Oh, it was, rage! It was uh, <laughs> the week. Uh, it was the Paddy's Day week. So obviously, oh. you know, as lockdown began, um, so not not really ideal. Um, that's kind of how I found it as well. Is that I was just reading the paper, and then because I live really close to the distillery. And I just saw that, oh, there's a grand opening of uh, of a new distillery uh, and it's 200 meters from where you live. So I was like, well, great, I'll, I'll check that out. Mm. Um, but then obviously lockdown happened and uh, I was walking past the industrial estate to go to a, a market because uh, it, it's basically situated in uh, an industrial estate. And uh, on the entrance to the industrial estate, I walked past what, again, had formerly been wasteland and I walked past before. Uh, and there was just suddenly a garden, a landscape garden there. And there was a little sign saying, oh, hey, uh, what's going on here? Like we're we're establishing a community garden. If you want to get involved, drop in to us and we can give you seed packs. We can give you grow kits to grow stuff at home and then you can bring back into the garden or you can bring stuff that you've brought, that you've grown at home anyway and then and bring it to us. So that was how I first got involved. Uh, and then it was uh, a couple of weeks 
before my final essays were due that I basically there was a, a vacancy for a gardener there and then uh, I went and uh, applied for that uh, and because they knew me because of being part of the social botanist program which is our community gardening program that worked out pretty well um, but then in terms of the company itself uh, so we, we have three pillars so it's science community and nature and that goes into everything we do so whether that's the distillation process with the products we make, we use a lot of equipment that wouldn't traditionally be, be used in uh, spirits making. So uh, we have like a centrifuge up there uh, in the lab. Uh, we have uh, a jewelry washer uh, as well. Jew- like a ju- Jew- yeah. Jewelry washer? Yeah. So it's, it's one of those um, ultrasonic baths, which is uh, kind of operates on vibrations basically, but it means you can age things super quickly so slow gin traditionally would take a few weeks for it to age uh, for you to kind of fully Mm -hmm. soak but you can you can pretty much do it to the same to to a similar uh or or some would say the same uh effect uh in in a matter of hours in the ultrasonic bath so and then we have our rotary evaporators as well so they they'll put they can put fresh botanicals in so if you think about things like mint if you take fresh mint and you make a tea with it it kind of gets a bit stewed. Uh, mm. it, it'll, that's why traditionally in tea bags you'd use dried herbs um, because that keeps it, it keeps in the, the essential oils that you you want to maintain in in that process and you want to keep in the tea uh, the nice minty minty freshness. Whereas when you use fresh stuff, you need to use more uh, chopped chopped foliage uh, than you would the dried stuff because a lot of the essential oils are lost in the heat heat process. Right. Evaporators again, you keep it at a lower temperature. Uh, and it maintains a lot of that, those essential oils, uh, and then the flavors that can go into, uh, into the spirits and become distillate. So, um, we use a lot of things like that and byproducts as well. So byproducts of the distillation process, uh, we can then put in an ice cream maker and make like a boozy ice cream for the week. Oh uh, my God. So there's a lot of things like that, that we kind of week in, week out, we're using a lot of things that would traditionally be thrown away or put aside as wastage uh, in the distillation process, but we're using them to make more products. In community, that really comes into it with the garden and the same with nature as well. But then even like one of our first products, we do a few ready to drink cocktails and uh, we do one called the Spent Espresso Martini, which is basically mm-hmm. an espresso martini, but we're using spent coffee grinds from some of the local cafes that I'll collect. Uh, oh my, my God, amazing. Um, so we, we have a, a cold brew, we use tonka beans as well, which adds like a vanilla like flavor to it. Um, and then there's a vegan foamer in there as well. So when you, if you pour it into a jar or a cocktail shaker, then you shake it, then it will, it will foam like an espresso martini would. Oh my so, God. It's a vegan cause be, like normal espresso martinis, the Kahlua in them isn't, mm-hmm. or is it the Kahlua? That's not vegan, but it's not even, there's no cream in it. I always thought there was cream in the thing, but it was, um, it's just the way it's filtered mm. or something filtered through fish guts or something odd yeah. i don't know how they discovered these things in the first yeah. place but um that's so cool oh my god ready to make cocktails and, and it's just it's amazing because there's people might be listening or might see still garden distillery and it, it would probably fall under the hipster category like there's a <laughs> lot of like these new breweries coming about and everyone's like oh everything's like really hipster or whatever but some people can be quite um judgmental and just presume that it's all you know about being unique or different whereas like still garden it's not that way at all like you mm. are actually being in ge- like genius with the with what you're doing to well it's a genius or just common sense about like saving waste and repurposing everything and it's just it's really kind of inspirational and yeah no definitely and it's just there's so many things that you can make use of that would normally be thrown away but i mean it one it cuts our costs down so it's it's a cost effective way of running running a business mm. um but at the same time you're not sacrificing flavor just for the sake of getting new products in so like it, even for things like uh ginger ale so we have ginger ale in the bar at the distillery ginger ale is the kind of thing that you know one person might come to the distillery that week and order something with ginger ale but then the bottle's gone like it goes it goes flat oh yes um but something we do is we repurpose that to make sham uh which is our version of like a non-alcoholic champagne so sham with an s and uh so we use that in the spritzes so that's the the ginger ale that we then recarbonate and then we add uh, white grape acids, which basically makes it taste a bit like champagne. That's what we use in the 
the bar uh, the distillery for for the spritzes and then we we use it in some of the other products as well like one of the non-alcoholic cocktails we use for that that's a super cost effective way of instead of importing prosecco importing sparkling wines it means that we can kind of basically use something that would have just been thrown away and pulled down the sink uh, and repurpose it to to use again in in one of the drinks as well and it's another way that like when you go into town if you're if you're looking for cocktails there'll be you might be paying 13 to 15 euro and for some places that's because there's a lot that goes into it i don't want to completely knock those prices because i know there are a lot of bartenders out there who work very hard on making all all the ingredients to go in and and the process of, of making delicious cocktails but then at the same time it means that we can keep our costs down to make them a competitive price for you know nine euro for a cocktail would be the standard at the distillery uh, and that's thanks to that kind of upcycling of waste products that we can yeah. we can make into new delicious drinks that's yeah that's absolutely brilliant and y- like when you say you use say mint or things from your garden obviously they probably have to substitute some kind of ingredients anyway what happens if they like blow up and everyone's like loving the still garden spirits which is like gin and vodka and because there are some companies that want to stay small scale and then some will obviously try and meet demand because you are trying to make a living or whatever but then how can you do that can you still kind of like supply a lot of your ingredients with community gardens and stuff or have you have you kind of thought about that how we kind of approach it really is there are, there are only a couple of things that we're really self-sufficient in from the garden uh one of which we're working on being self-sufficient in it's just when we started there was a lot of dried lavender that was bought in to basically get us started with with making mm. our, our flagship gin actually yeah i'll, I'll start with uh, how the social bottings program kind of came about so it was during march 2020 when lockdown happened and uh, obviously bars in dublin were closed for more than a year uh, some mm. of them so a lot of bartenders were out of work and we gave hydroponic kits to these out of work bartenders who then grew botanicals at home two of the botanicals that did really well were mint and lavender and they came back and planted those in the garden uh, we then had a taste test with uh, distillates with different levels of mint and lavender and then selected a favorite. So that was done with the social botanists uh, and, that, and that became our social gin, so which is our flagship gin. So then in order to to meet demand and, and, and to be able to have enough when the garden was just being established and there wasn't much lavender there, uh, that so we would have got the lavender in then. But now we have quite a lot of lavender that I've been harvesting and drying. So we will have enough just from the garden now to, to kind of see ourselves forward. Amazing. Um, but in, in terms of not wasting what we already have, so we're still using some of the, that original stock as well. Uh, but then th- with rhubarb, uh, we are self-sufficient in that. Uh, so we have a rhubarb vodka and then the Amaro, which is the sister product of the Brie Smell, um, which is basically Ireland's first Amaro, which would be in the kind of Campari Aperol family. Uh, it's our kind of take on Campari. So an orange bitter base then sweetened with raspberry leaf and rhubarb. Uh, and all the rhubarb, uh, from that comes from from the garden That's and okay. the same with the rhubarb vodka as well but then beyond that we tend to see the garden more as a flavor scape and for our distiller to use for research and development so we can see things that grow in ireland that we can access in ireland that potentially we can forage as well so then the research and development is very minimal cost um, luke can have a play around with flavors without too much wastage because we know because we've grown it ourselves there's no kind of import costs or um, import emissions uh, that, that we're contributing to there. Um, but then with certain things like juniper, we'd have to go a bit further afield. Um, juniper does grow in Ireland, like it grows in the barren pretty well, but it doesn't seem to be something that is cultivated so much here. And that's obviously the quintessential ingredient in gin. So without juniper, that it would just be a vodka. So, I mean, we kind of would look at it. So can we, can we grow it? Can we forage it sustainably and responsibly? Mm-hmm. Um, if not, then we'll go to local producers and then we'll look further afield. Uh, beyond that so well that's like a really responsible approach that definitely more people could be taken and that's really cool mm. like let's see if it can grow here and then we'll use it in our drinks as opposed to putting making i don't know avocado gin but then again yeah. you can grow an avocado tree so yeah this is true <laughs> uh but then it's it's interesting because like uh we have quite a lot of things that we can use that have kind of the citrus and lemon flavor um and lemon scent mm. so we have lemon verbena we have lemon balm we have lemon scented geranium. So, I mean, there's quite a few different lemon scented things. So then we can kind of use that instead of using the lemons that we'd have to import. Uh, so I know Luke Artistil has made a lemon cello out of the, uh, the lemon thyme we have growing in the wow. garden, actually. Uh, and he made it out of lemon verbena as well. 
So it's kind of using those flavors instead. Uh, and I know we did something a while back as well. We did a, like a, a Tom Collins, although we called it a Nom Collins because it was in an edible cup. <laughs> and then we had a lemon foam on top of that, which is made with lemon thyme. So again, instead of using the, the citrus, uh, we could actually use a herb that we can grow in Ireland uh, and that That's we grew amazing. in the garden. Instead. Like it can literally, it just uses a little bit of imagination. To, we don't, if people think, you know, if we didn't have a world kind of trade or whatever, that there, we'd only be eating turnip and potatoes. But like there's so much available mm. here. There are a lot, we could get loads of different flavors still if we just kind of go back to these kind of these skills that we've lost and this knowledge that we have lost and forgotten because of course it came all of a sudden there's lemons and little and you don't need to, yeah, to know yeah. anything anymore but it's so much more enjoyable and I guess speaking of enjoyable like what kind of what kind of benefits have you experienced from the community gardening aspect of things I mean I think for me because because I kind of came into it first as like a member of the community gardening project and that was during the height of lockdown where, you know, you were only sticking to your area. Yeah, two couldn't kilometers. Couldn't go inside. Yeah. Um, and luckily I was 200 meters from the distillery, so that wasn't <laughs> too, too too bad for me to pop into. But I, I don't know about you, but I found COVID was a really weird time in that it was so, so isolating. But then going to the distillery, and that was when I first got to know Luke, uh, Luke Amara, our distiller. Um, who was kind of running the social botanist project at the time. And Neil, who was the gardener uh, before me, that was like a a really nice welcoming atmosphere. Uh, and it felt like I, you know, it was having a connection with the person again. It was, yeah. it was someone new, uh, like someone I didn't know before. Um, I had that with uh, the coffee shop as well, my local coffee shop, Unfiltered, um, where I really got to to know those guys there, going there every day uh, as an excuse to get out the house. And I find that now with collecting the coffee grinds from the different cafes, so sometimes I get it from Unfiltered, uh, I get it a lot from Greenville Deli, which is uh, just down the road too. You know, getting to know those guys working there, it, that's that's really nice. I like being able to walk around the area where I live and, and bump into people that I know. Uh, I know mm. some people find that a bit rough. <laughs> if, you, if you're from a place and you always just bump into people, you know, you can maybe feel that you don't get much privacy but at least for me because i moved here the people that i'm bumping into i kind of want to see it's it's a nice nice thing yeah. to see and especially after such a time where you know it feeling so isolated and disconnected feeling that sense of connection again is really nice um of course and it's so lovely to know that you can have that in the city as well you know yeah. you often hear that this is something that you can only get in the countryside where you're living in yeah. in Shakur, Dublin 8 which you know is really up and coming there's a lot there's beautiful when we were walking around far on the Farajan walk mm. I, the art installations there's like this community center that I walked by I was like this place is amazing yeah um so you can really foster that in cities as well it doesn't have to be just a countryside thing but I know like I've got a friend of mine from Cavan and he's like every two meters I walk someone stops me and has to chat to me for five minutes yeah. about how my granddad was a DJ and I was like well in fairness now that's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I can understand it can be a bit tiring to some people yeah um but it's really good to have that option you know and absolutely ju just getting to getting to know people it's like you're kind of like a modern day milkman or something like you're going around <laughs> collecting things dropping things off yeah. and people do get get to know you and it is it is really lovely. Yeah. And like, it's, yeah, it's funny because in England, where, where I'm from, believe it or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, if I, like my, my hometown, I'd bump into people and I would hate it. I'd hate, I'd hate seeing people everywhere. And I still, I still do. Yeah. But then here, here it's a completely different story. Um, but That's another, funny. like a, another kind of thing that the community gardening is really giving to me is a real sense of fulfillment in that we've been able to transform this place from wasteland into this community oasis really where i'll see people sit down and enjoy people will bring their kids um mm. you'll see people meet there for coffee you'll see uh like uh, i i remembered when i was planting a load of lavender my first summer there and there was just a, a little girl who came up to me and was just asking about like all the plants that that were around like saying what's that what's that what's that uh and that's just such like a, a special thing uh to have and then yeah. also the fact that you know we've we've transformed this area for wildlife as well so we've seen so many different types of bees take up residency in the garden lots of different types of ladybirds damselflies dragonflies moths uh, butterflies and like uh, we have a little section in the estate 
uh, that we've also worked on that is probably my proudest achievement with uh, that I've done with the social botanists, which is a uh, we worked with Pocket Forest. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of them. Yeah, I I, met, I was trying to get I'm trying to get them on the podcast. Like yeah. I like, love what they do is amazing, and I saw this little Pocket for- Forest section. But yeah, if you could explain for your listeners who probably might not know. Yeah, so I mean, Pocket Forest they run workshops and they also will give gift native trees and help you kind of set up an area in an urban space to plant a mini native pocket forest there. So we, we did some work with them. We we took a, another part of the industrial estate, which was also used as a dumping site. Again, some really interesting things growing there, uh, but because it looked neglected, people were leaving fridges and stuff like that there. And we cleared. <laughs> What's it with the fridges, guys? <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of, yeah, interesting interesting things growing there like there's a beautiful ash tree there's a giant elder tree one of the biggest wild roses i've ever seen which just has thorns the size of my thumb and we cleared 20 bags of rubbish from there and it's still a load we found a cat skull in the process we found like what hit we found like a, a thigh bone as well of a uh, human uh hopefully not uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, i don't think so but it was definitely it, it might have been a fox it was a big like that. yeah big it was big of, enough yeah uh but i i was told by someone uh reliably that it was the wrong color to be human which uh perhaps raised more questions than <laughs> i wanted to ask how do you know <laughs> yeah exactly uh, but we found Very some cool. toads and, and and frogs underneath the rubbish uh oh. and so we actually we we were gifted a pond by one of the social botanists uh richard and like a, a little pond uh metal basin and we were going to put it in the garden but then i th- and there is still a plan to have like a pond pond like area in the garden as well to mm-hmm. to encourage amphibians and, and more dragonflies and damselflies but then after seeing the frogs and toads we were like mm, maybe this this is the spot to put it in and just recently saw uh frogs have moved in they've they've found it so <gasps> so that's oh, yeah. the thing like holly ennis talks about that in his episode and mm. uh, mary reynolds as well like literally build it and they will come like within yeah. sometimes within hours you'll have flies hovering above water yeah. or something like that's like it gives life so that's why i mean in a lot of public spaces dublin city council won't put in ponds because of insurance and that but if people have like those little front gardens or wherever where they could just add a little body of water that's amazing so and yeah. the canals as well they get dredged every few months or every year or something so that boats can still like move through them so it's good to have like safe places like like mm. that um it's a gorgeous little spot and i guess speaking of people with land you mentioned that you are in a flat but you're a gardener um you have a compost bin so have you kind of are, do you grow things in your windowsill as well or have you got any tips for people who also either rent like me or are in apartments if they want to kind of get into any of this yeah i mean uh one of the great things about the hydroponic kits that we give out to to people and we give out to those first bartenders is that they have grow lights on them so it means that you can effectively live in a dark room you don't need a sunny windowsill that you can grow things like that and i know we're not the only kind of initiative and community group that will offer these to people so i i mean there's a there's a website called culture near you which tends to have quite a lot of uh good stuff about community gardens uh, there's community gardens island i believe as well uh so yeah. community groups are all over the place it's kind of just knowing where to look sometimes mm-hmm. uh, and they can have good resources like the hydroponic kits to to kind of get you started at home and i know in Inchcore we have a really good environmental group Inchcore environmental group and we have a really engaged community that will give seeds to each other you know you, you buy a pack of seeds sometimes there are thousands of seeds in there and you don't need you don't need all of them um so that's a good way to get to get stuff for free but in all honesty like uh, i mean i do grow a lot of things at home i'm really lucky in that i'm south west and north facing so i pretty much get light in my apartment all day oh cool um and i've been lucky that wherever i've lived i've always been south facing in, in dublin uh, <laughs> so uh, that also helps with being able to grow things that, that combined with your fluky avocado seeds you've just got yeah. the, the look at the green thumb yeah um but herbs are something that do really well on windowsills uh most of the year as well um i know what you were saying about uh struggling with them before when when you've been given them but the supermarket ones can be pretty tricky because they overcrowd mm. them they they kind of put loads and loads of seeds in one tiny pot and then there's not enough space for them uh, there are certain plants like 
coriander and dill who don't like being transplanted either so they don't like moving from they where they've like been moving. placed yeah. so like when i what i find is when i have dill and coriander growing in the garden and we've just put the seeds down and then they've germinated and grown they're really strong they can deal with the wind they can deal with the rain they'll still be upright but then if i get a coriander pot from from the supermarket and then i might put it into a new pot which it needs because of the space and then it might just flop over and die yeah. so it's kind of looking up for little tips like that coriander uh, is something that sprouts and germinates really easy so you just need a few seeds uh you can just sprinkle them onto uh onto some soil uh of, of free draining compost water it and then you'll see the shoots come and then you want to eat it as it kind of starts to the foliage starts to expand uh rocket as well rocket grows really well um and mm-hmm. that's something that will grow through the winter as well uh, in a similar way in that you just put the seeds down let them grow and then snip them and then put more seeds down if you need to press like that's something that's great you don't even need soil for cress you can just have like a bit of wet um, wet tissue isn't it wet tissue yeah, yeah. Uh, and then and then it'll kind of grow in in four days really like i, I just grew Amazing. some four days ago and already the, the shoots are kind of ready to eat um that's so cool. and they're so like high in nutrients as well very nutrient yeah. dense grasses and everything yeah um yeah so they're that's good really good to hear that there's loads of things that can be done in apartments and that although i am one of those Mm. people who coriander tastes like soap uh coriander is a devil you know what me too i coriander really to me and yet i still eat it i I, that that definitely says more about me that definitely says more about me Um, but Um, like what you said about aloe vera as well aloe vera is a brilliant one aloe vera is actually the first Mm. plant that i was given by anyone by my grandmother and i still have it now Oh, aloe vera is something that you can let basically die and then giving it a bit of water will regenerate it and it will come yeah. back so it can look like it's fried on the brink of death yeah uh, like there's no kind of water or liquid left in it and then you give it a bit of water if it absorbs it it's likely you'll see green within a few days Wow! Um, and they're so good for healing like that's that's the one thing my mom she we i grew up in the countryside as well and even though I know very little about things like she was always good if say if we got a nettle sting she would get dock leaves straight away I don't even know if they mm. would do do anything but like it was the home and like she'd like spit on it and make this like <laughs> pulses thing um and like rub that and like nettle stings and then if I ever bought like burns or anything like she would take um get an aloe vera and get the gel of the inside of it and put that mm. on a burn or a cut and I used to think this was so cool I was like look at her like use them plans to heal me she's yeah. like a witch this is amazing but there's such basic things like so yeah our aloe vera uh, is going strong in this house thankfully <sighs> but i know this is of course we're in autumn now this is harvesting mm. season and mm. i was blown away on the foraging walk that uh you led by the free food that i'm walking by like walking by every day like a bloody idiot there's me <laughs> buying hazelnuts in a shop when they are literally growing on trees on that they're all scattering the floor because people don't realize what they are yeah and i just wanted to be like does everyone know there's hazelnuts here so have you got yeah. like foraging tips or because i know it can be quite hard i find it quite scary <laughs> if i'm not mm. with somebody if it's not a blackberry i don't know what it is it could kill me do you know so yeah. what kind of tips would you have if people were going to try get into foraging i mean i'd start simple because obviously foraging is a wonderful thing i absolutely love it but i, I understand the fear and worry uh of not wanting to eat the wrong thing that uh especially with all our sensitive tummies nowadays um i mean it's something i really got into because i'm allergic to gluten and dairy so like i'm oh, no pretty way. much allergic to all the the man-made processed foods wow. <laughs> Oh yeah. If I want to eat, I've got to be rummaging through bushes to, to do that. Uh, There's no I, gluten in the bushes. <laughs> no, I, I remember it was. Uh, I used to mortify some of my college friends in that we'd get uh, I don't know a burrito or something, or I'd have a burrito bowl, and then I'd uh, we'd be on on campus, and I'd just be rummaging through bushes to go and get some garnishes uh, to go on top. Um, Love and, it. Yeah, and my friends would pretend they didn't know me, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah. So I'd start simple. Uh, so look for things that either have a very notable scent uh, or visual appearance that can't be misidentified by uh, with with anything else. Uh, so where I first started because of that reason is wild garlic. So mm. wild garlic is something that you come across 
the ransoms, which is the native native version of, of wild garlic, or one of them that we have growing here, uh, that you will smell just coming across. Uh, yeah. It's very obvious. You'll be the... walking by and you will yeah. smell garlic in the air. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, 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 everyone knows what a dandelion is. Uh, the young leaves of that are edible. They're very bitter. You might get them in some mad salad mixes. Uh, they they are in some supermarket ones, uh, but they're, they're very bitter. Uh, so I wouldn't... It's the kind of thing that I used to eat to show off that I could eat wild foods, uh, but then would regret it pretty much instantly. Um, but you can dry, you can dry the leaves, the roots as well. You'd use with with roots. It's a bit more difficult with foraging because you need landowners' permission to be digging up roots. But if they're in your garden, then you can with dandelion. You can roast and then basically use as a coffee substitute. So Whoa. for me, I really like dandelion root coffee, but. It doesn't taste like coffee to me. It's 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 okay. its own drink. It's its own taste. Like, is drink. it caffeinated? Is that why people? So, no, it's a, it's like a caffeine alternative. Oh. Um, okay, okay. But uh, if like if 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 you want something that's a bit more bitter, like uh, coffee would be, I would say chicory root is one to go for there. Or I hear barley as well is also used, but I can't have that because of the gluten. But uh, some of the common names for dandelion refer to to how it would help passing urine if if you're if you're not able to do that. So. Uh, that would be some of the traditional remedies. Yeah, there's so like many that. like healing properties as well that we just don't mm. know about that that can that can help with the, like with things. I just yeah, they really I'd love if they taught more of this in schools. But yeah. I get, do you know of any kind of resources? I mean, like there, you do foraging walks with Still Garden. Like, are they open to the public? Yeah, I mean, so I'll do them with the social botanists. Uh, the best way to kind of keep up to date with what we do there is follow the Instagram and then I'll post whenever we have something planned to going ahead. We do foraging walks, but we do gardening, community gardening, and then uh, community cleanups as well. We just did one recently with Intercore Environmental Group for Dublin Community Cleanup. Um, but awesome. in terms of foraging resources, yeah, uh, there's there's a few good websites like it's a UK website, but Wild Food UK, that's that's a good one. It will tell you as well if there's a plant on there that could be confused with something else. Um, and that one big thing that you've got to be really careful with if you are foraging is the carrot family. And that the carrot family sounds delicious. Great mm. carrots. Uh, but there's a lot in there that is highly toxic. Like even wild parsnip, which the name of that sounds great. It sounds it's like, absolutely edible. That. That's for Christmas dinner. Yeah, but if you touch it, it will give you blisters. So oh you God. don't you, you don't want to be messing Why around didn't with that. they call it blister plant? I don't understand. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's on them, to be fair now. <laughs> exactly. You're just exactly. asking for trouble. <laughs> yeah. Another good one as well that kind of got me interested was uh, a book called A Quick Cup of Herbal by Fionn mm -hmm. O'Noilon. Uh, I think he's based in Dublin as well. Uh, also known as the holistic gardener uh, and that goes through like a lot of the herbal properties of teas and different types of herbal teas you can use and then I was kind of going through that and think and then looking at the different herbs stuff like horsetail and thinking oh does that grow in Ireland and then saying yes it's everywhere so we're on our foraging walk we would have gone past loads of it there's also a brilliant show that was on RTE recently um, called Fuivla which is like a mm -hmm. an Irish language look at uh different wildflowers that we have growing in, in ireland uh, and in different habitats and then also some of the traditional uses for it so um that's a brilliant show that's well worth a watch very good yeah there's loads of stuff out there it's so funny though because i went to work after the foraging walk and i was like a, a few minutes late because i just didn't want to leave <laughs> and i arrived they were like oh nice of you to join us i was like sorry i was foraging <laughs> <laughs> my supervisor starts laughing at me mark was like course you were i was like this is you guys have i wasn't like crawling around in the dirt you know <laughs> swinging from trees like a celt or something like yeah. there's such like a perception from some people that foraging is like you know dumpster diving like it's like the mm. lowest of the but i mean i dumpster diving i think is even amazing because you find some amazing things in skips yeah. um and that people just throw out but there's a there's definitely a perception thing that some people uh need to need to work on but i yeah i'm gonna keep talking to my friends about how cool it is to see a plant be able to mm. identify it know if you can eat it or not it's just so cool but i know we're kind of running out of time but have you got any kind of tips or leaves to offer to listeners um, to live more kind of eco-friendly is there anything else that you'd like to add on top of what we were chatting about 
I mean, I guess like a big one for me with when I joined the distillery was moving from using just the standard multi-purpose compost to a peat-free compost. Okay, uh, yeah. That's very important to me in terms of the the decimation of peat stores yeah. and uh, and uh, peat resources around around the globe, and like especially in Ireland where you know the bogs are the islands, rainforests effectively, yeah. and they're, they're such an important habitat for loads of different wildlife and if we keep depleting it with the rate we are then it's not looking good no uh, the problem the main problem with it is that it's actually quite difficult to see whether a compost is peat or peat free yeah um it's getting better i know like uh and q their their kind of standard multi-purpose compost now is peat free brilliant um but then there's a lot of garden centers and and kind of homeware stores that it wouldn't it, it's not the standard just yet and you do have to search uh, a bit a bit harder yeah. for it and it can be a bit more expensive as well which is also an issue but uh, at least for me as well working in the alcohol industry which in terms of with whiskey and how much peat is used in that process it's, it's Keith, something do you that... making whiskey uh for scotch yeah oh i didn't know that yeah it would be and in terms of uh, that's where a lot of the smokiness can come from that's a really good tip thank you so much and now we are going to pivot wildly to some <laughs> random questions, Connor, if you yeah. would like to give me a letter of the alphabet and cool. I just want to ask you some things. 27 okay. questions is what I want to ask you, but we haven't got that kind of time. So, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give you G for gardener. G for gardener. <clears throat> What's your favorite documentary? Oh, there's one called The Imposter. It's about a guy who pretended to be someone's missing child. Uh, but was accepted back into the family and he's like telling he's like telling you how what what happened and why did it and it, it, it involves interviews with the family and stuff like that and yeah it's it's bonkers like it's literally like a someone who looks like a 40 year old man turning up and saying i'm your 20 year old son who oh went my god kind of <gasps> i mean that could happen well obviously it yeah. did happen what yeah. the heck that's <laughs> wild where can people watch that uh, I think it used to just be on YouTube, um, actually. Wow. Oh my yeah, God, I have to dig that's that where out. I saw it. But uh, no, it's it's haunting. It's like, it's so disturbing. But uh, yeah, it hasn't left my mind. Oh my God, that is wild. Okay, thank you for that recommendation. Um, give us another letter. Okay, uh, P. What's your favorite secondhand find? Probably this candle holder right here. Oh! Okay, so at home Which, we're getting a little, it's like a white candle. It looks kind of very classic and it's got floral designs on it, purple. Yeah. Are they are they violets? Uh, I think so. They look like violets, yeah. <laughs> they look like violets. Yeah. Where did you and get then, that? Uh, there's a salvage yard by the Memorial Gardens and uh, I got it in there. So, uh, and I, I had these long uh, beeswax candlesticks that i had nowhere to put in uh, and then i saw that and i was like wow it's it's a match made in heaven that's amazing yeah. that's really cool i love like little things like that when they show up i was looking for batteries for my bike lights for so long i just didn't want to buy them new like the little circular kind of watch batteries mm -hmm. and then i use olio for like getting rid of things it, it's an app that you can you share things on it or you just give away for doing a clear out give away anything clothes and food it's brilliant for as well um, and someone Amazing. put up those lights. I was like, ah, this is my day. It's so funny. Yeah. Like when, cause obviously if I just went to a shop, I just would have bought them. But because I was like, no, I'll hold off. I'm not going to buy them and holding off the search and like buying the candle holder or buying the batteries when you did find it then it was just like so i was like this is amazing and everyone's like they're just batteries carrot but i'm like no because i didn't <laughs> buy them but anyway <laughs> that's a lovely little thing to end on where can people find you connor if they want to keep up to date with your own work uh so probably on instagram so i'm just at the gardener d-e-r which is it's not so it sounds like the garden order <laughs> but uh, it's actually the gardener der, which is the German for uh, German masculine pronoun, um, because my WhatsApp is in German and I'm in all these environmental groups, uh, groups on, on, on there uh, for the local area. Uh, but my name on WhatsApp is der Connor, as in like he, him, Connor. Uh. Um, but uh, so then people kept thinking I was called Dare. Presumably, uh, they thought my name was Derek O'Connor, and and people would turn up to the distillery looking for Dare, 
which I think is is one of my favorite little <laughs> weird weird <laughs> nonsense things. So that that's actually why uh, my name is on that. But uh, Let's so, go. I mean that's that's my that's my personal one. But then uh, the Still Garden Social Botanist. So that's Still Garden underscore Social Botanist is a is a great way to see yeah. all the things we have going on there. As well. Amazing. I'll drawing. link all those in the show notes as well. And thank you. I should say thank you for all of the work that you do, Connor. Thank Good you so share. much. <laughs> there you go, guys. I hope you're able to take a leaf or two out of Connor's book when it comes to growing, or maybe you're at home making some bathtub gin and you've got some new tips as to where you can get your ingredients. So I know a few people who make their own spirits at home and their own home brews and home wines. And obviously, it's uh, it's applicable. These kind of tips that Connor was given from Still Garden are applicable to you guys as well. But as I said, everything he's mentioned is linked in the show notes, uh, including their socials. So you can stay up to date with any new events. And the garden that is at Still Garden is open to the public. So you don't need to like be a member. They have their opening hours on their website. So you can literally just stroll along and see the garden that they use for like their research and development and for some of their ingredients, which is I think pretty cool. I love um, places being accessible like that. It's amazing. So more of this, please. And uh, do let them know any bartenders, anyone who works in the industry that way in spirits, you can send them on to Still Garden. Still Garden like work with bartenders and bring them on foraging trips and and, uh, and like talk to them about how to be more kind of um, environmentally conscious and everything like that. And build, they're building a community. It's just lovely. So I'm delighted that I got to chat to Connor. I hope you guys were able to take something out of this interview. And if you have any suggestions or topics you would like to hear, if you have any questions you'd like to add to the random questions, let me know. And if you have any questions or suggestions in general for me or for Connor, you can reach out to us on our socials. And Book of Leaves has a website as well. If the show notes that are linked below don't actually have a fit like linked links like you can't actually click into anything if you go on to bookofleavespodcast.com you'll find all the links working there that's it thank you guys so much for listening and from this award-winning Irish podcast I will say goodbye okay that's it I'm, I'm not gonna like go I'm not I won't drag the award-winning thing out but this is just the first episode since the award so I just got it I just got it thank you guys so much have a lovely week or two weeks and I will talk to you soon Bye.